Well, if I have to be snowed in on Christmas, I'm sure glad it's at your house. Ah, oh, well, we can still have a celebration. What about some music? Oh, we could play forfeits. Or blind man's bluff. Oh, or how, when, and where. Or yes and no. How about this? The bookstore just got it in from England. Ah. Ooh. Shall I read? Please. Marley was dead to begin with. There is no doubt whatever about that. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge himself signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was dead as a doornail. Oh, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone, Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. Spirit, said Scrooge in a broken voice, remove me from this place. I told you there were shadows of things that have been, said the ghost, that they are what they are. Do not blame me. And how did little Tim behave, asked Mrs. Cratchit when she had rallied Bob on his credulity, and Bob had hugged his daughter to his heart's content. As good as gold, said Bob, and better. Spirit, he cried, tight clutching at its robe. Hear me. I am not the man I was. I will not be the man I must have been. But he was early at the office next morning. Oh, he was early there. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late. That was the thing he had set his heart upon. And he did it, yes he did. The clock struck nine, no Bob. A quarter past, no Bob. He was full 18 minutes and a half behind his time. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might catch him coming into the tank. Hello? What do you mean by coming in here at this hour? I, I, I am behind my time, sir, I'm very sorry. You are? Yes, I think you are. I was making rather merry yesterday, sir. It only happens once a year. It will not now be repeated. Now I will tell you this, my friend. I will not stand for this any longer. And therefore, and therefore, I'm about to raise your salary. A merry Christmas, Bob. And a merrier Christmas than I have given you in many a year, my good fellow. I shall raise your salary and endeavor to help your struggling family. And we shall discuss your affairs this very afternoon over a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop, Bob. A bowl of what? Over a bowl of smoking bishop. Bob. I don't know what that is either. Welcome to this year's Christmas episode on the Victorian Barroom. Today, we are going to be making the Smoking Bishop from Charles Dickens's A Christmas Carol, and we are at Musée des Vinoges. This is one of our favorite historic sites. Uh, they throw one of the best historic Christmas parties anywhere here. You should absolutely come out and see it in December. And I'd like to introduce our two special guests today. We've got Donna Weaver, I'd call the founder of the feast, and the Colonel, Steve Abel. So tell us about where we are. Uh, we're at Musée de Vinoge, which is an 1828 house built by Jacob Weaver and his wife, Charlotte Golay Weaver. They came here, uh, as a lot of the French Swiss did, to grow grapes, wine grapes, and make wine, which they did. Uh, we've restored this house, and we, do, we shoot our videos here. Mr. Abel is responsible for a lot of that. And we were able to use Brian and Amy over here in a full-length film and in a series that we have. And so we got to be very good friends, and it's really nice to be here at Christmas time at this special time to do this special program for you. And I know if you've seen Brian's videos on the Victorian Barroom, you know you're in for a really good <laughs> beverage today. Well, thank you. And uh, this place, like you know, most of the other places we go, they they are they're sustained on the generosity and the enthusiasm of their community. So we're going to have a link in the description here. It's going to be the first one you see. Uh, slide these guys a few bucks. You know, if you really like what you see here and you'd like to support their mission. Uh, these places exist on the dedication of the people who care about them. Uh, and so that's something we really wanted to bring home today. So. 
Let's get into the beverage. Now the recipes for this are always just labeled Bishop. Smoking was probably Charles Dickens' descriptor of it being very hot and looks like it's smoking. So we are gonna do a recipe for Bishop. What this literally comes from is Eliza Acton's cookbook of 1845. Eliza Acton was an English cookbook author. She predated Mrs. Beaton. Personally, I prefer her work to Mrs. Beaton's and I think that it's still one of the best uh, cookbooks that has been written to this day. What she did was she reprinted the recipe for Bishop from Oxford Nightcaps, another English book, the earliest for that that I've seen is 1827. And the interesting thing about their version is they list lemons as the roasted citrus that goes into it, admitting that oranges were more common. Eliza Acton reprinted their recipe truly, but she specified, no, really, you want to use oranges for this. Uh, and oranges have been used in every other version that I've seen, and so that's what we are going to do today. The spirit that goes into Bishop is port, Port is a fortified wine that comes from Portugal, especially popular in the early Victorian period, partially because imports of alcohol into England were taxed based on their country of origin, not their alcohol content. So England was usually more friendly with Portugal than they were with France. And so this high proof wine uh, was actually cheaper than the unfortified French versions. Now, a safe rule when you're getting port for something like this, the 15 to $20 range, at least in my region, I'm in Kentucky, uh, is about the lowest you want to go to. Uh, otherwise, you're going to start to get some nasty aftertastes. I don't even like to use the other stuff for mixing. So I do keep my mixing port in the $15 to $20 range because over that, and I usually just like to enjoy the port for what it is. So we are using Awfully today. It's uh, very nice, it's tasty, and it's going to work great in this. So I've broken this down into three phases today. We're going to be at the table, we're going to go to the fire, and then we're going to come back to the table. The first thing we're going to want to do is uh, we are going to want to peel a lemon and we are going to let it rest in sugar for a half hour to an hour. And that's going to draw out the oils. And this is actually the way that most punches start. And that goes back to the 17th century, okay? And I'm going to apologize. We lost our nice period neutral looking vegetable peeler and Here's what the Kroger had. Uh, and that's really all you need to peel this citrus. And you're gonna wanna, you're gonna wanna just get as much yellow and as little white as possible. And you're gonna wanna keep it in whoop, as continuous of a ribbon as possible. Um, and don't be discouraged if, if when you start off, uh, it's, it's not very consistent because mine broke off in little bits when I first started. And, and these days I can get a lemon done, sometimes in one continuous ribbon. Not too bad on that. So I got a little white in there, but it's really, it's pretty clear, mostly, mostly yellow. Um, this is important because you're not going to want a bunch of little bits of lemon in your drink. And especially if you want to save this overnight, you are going to want to remove that lemon peel. Otherwise, it's going to impart kind of a nasty taste overnight. So just let it do its thing while you're drinking it, get it out of there and discard it. Um, it did not specify how much sugar to use. And so we went with uh, David Wandrich's recommendation of two ounces per lemon. Okay, and so that's gonna be four tablespoons if you're doing it at home. So I've got four tablespoons or two ounces of lemon here. I've got my peel of one lemon. I'm gonna put that together and I'm gonna use my muddler to kind of mix it around, muddle it up. And over the course of the hour, I might continue to, to mix that up a little bit. But what you'll, what you'll see happening over the course of the hour is that um, the sugar is going to draw the oils of the lemon out, and that's really going to help what it does for the punch. Now, what we're going to do in a second is we are going to roast an orange over the fire, okay? It is very delicious if you can do it over a fire. If you don't have a fire, you're using your at-home oven, place the skin side down in your oven at 400 degrees, and you're going to want to go between 30 and 40 minutes, whenever it looks nicely brown but not burnt. Uh, they specified Seville oranges, and we don't usually have those around here, so just get the nicest orange that you can get. We're going to cut that in half. And now we're going to cut small slits and stick them with whole cloves. Now, it doesn't say how many cloves, but there was a wonderful book written uh, back in the early 80s called Convivial Dickens, where uh, some guys, um, they, 
they basically they made a book about all the drinks that are mentioned in Dickens. And the reason we're not using their recipe today is because we wanted to go with just primary documentation. Uh, but it's a very good recipe. And their recommendation was to do a dozen cloves per orange. And so that's what we're going to do today. We'll do six cloves per half. And so we're just going to cut little incisions for them to go in. And we will stick our cloves in our incisions. You can do a nice little design like a pomander if you like. Okay, so those are ready. The other thing we're going to do is we're going to take that lemon and we are going to juice it and set that juice aside. We have 10 ounces of water in this pan, and in this is going to go a few different spices. Um, it only says to use a small quantity, but equal of each spice. And what we have determined is a quarter teaspoon of each is about right, any more than that, and you're gonna start to get an unpleasant bitter taste on the back of the drink. So we've got cinnamon, allspice, nutmeg, clove, mace, and then I've grated just a little bit of fresh ginger root. Throw that in there. So all those wonderful spices that really just kind of evoke that mood of Christmas. We're gonna mix it up. Now we're gonna go to the fire. So now I've pulled some coals out from the fire underneath our oranges right here, uh, and we're just gonna let them roast up until they're nice and brown. We'll do either side of them. We're gonna do the skin side first because that's gonna kind of dry up the top and um, you know, that'll leave them less likely to weep onto the fire itself. Uh, again, like I say, you can do this at home. That's usually what I'm stuck doing. Uh, so just try a 400 degree oven for maybe 30 or 40 minutes. While the oranges are roasting, we've got our spice mixture in the kettle. And we are just going to put that over the fire. Now you want it to boil, you want to stir it so it doesn't scorch. And the directions are to reduce it by one half. So you're just going to have to eyeball that. When you think it looks like about half the quantity you put in there, it's time for it to come off. Okay, this is reduced about a half. You're just going to have to eyeball this, okay? it's. Uh, it's not really an exact science. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna pour the port on top of that. And it says to let it boil. Now, this is something where your own personal preferences can come in. If you're not somebody who likes much of a potent drink, you might wanna let it boil a little longer. Uh, it'll um, reduce that alcohol content. What I'm gonna do, because we do like potent drinks, is I'm going to just let it boil and then I'm going to pull it out. So we have a boil. Now, here's where I'm gonna depart from the recipe a little bit. I have indulged the idiosyncrasies of this recipe this whole time. Uh, they specify that you now put a lighted paper onto the spirit and let some of the spirit, uh, some of the alcohol burn off. I'm not going to do that for a number of reasons. Um, it's the only place I've ever seen that happen. I, it's hard enough to get a high proof spirit to light. Uh, so we're just gonna leave it like this. So we've got our spices uh, in here. Our port has just boiled. We're gonna take our roasted oranges Drop them inside. And now you're not actually cooking it. We're just going to let it warm near the fire for about 10 minutes, and then we're gonna take it back to the table. And now here it is. Oh, it smells like Christmas. All goes into the bowl. And this is when our mixture from earlier goes in. There's nothing quite like peeling those lemons and getting the oil <laughs> right. into that sugar. It's, it's like magic to watch. Yeah. I smell so good. Yeah. I feel it. I smell it wafting this yeah. way. And our lemon juice. 
We're gonna get that all combined. Now here's another step where you can customize it yourself if you like, because this is where you can sweeten to taste. But I can tell you already, we've already tried this, and this is as much sugar as we mm. prefer to have in this. But if you like a sweeter beverage, feel free. And now a generous nutmegan. Of course, what would a drink be without <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> nutmeg? I got a floor at home that needs sanding. If you want to do this. <laughs> and some for everyone. This is the wonderful punch ladle that was a Christmas gift from Amy a few years ago. Half the fun is watching him try to make this ladle work. <laughs> Mrs. Weaver. Thank you, yep. sir. Colonel Abel. Thank you, sir. Are you Mrs. Cushing or Mrs. Lieber? Oh, I'll answer to either. Okay. <laughs> that sounds just like Scrooge. <laughs> And here is to a happy Christmas. One happy and all. Christmas. Happy Christmas. Christmas. Happy Christmas here in one of happy our Christmas. absolute favorite places. Mm. Oh, not only smells like Christmas, it That's tastes really like Christmas. <laughs> it has a little bit of all the elements. It does. It, does it? Yeah. That's excellent. Mm. You know, tasting this brings back some really lovely memories of um, Christmas parties we've all had right mm. here at the Oh, at the yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, with you all. Well, it's all the spices, the citrus, the, the, the heavy sweet wine, mm. you know. The only thing missing is all the cars driving by. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we can arrange that. Mm. Thank you. Oh, that's so good. Oh, that is delicious. So, folks, here it is. Um, this is one of our favorite places, one of our the best historic holiday Christmas gatherings that we do all year happens here. Um, these are some of our favorite people. And so we were just really happy to come to Vinoge and to do Smoking Bishop. We didn't want to do this until we could do it with you guys. Well, thank you. That's so. quite an honor. Thank you both. Thank you both. I don't think I've tinked oh, you yet, Donna. <laughs> so how does the story end? It was said of Scrooge, he could keep Christmas as well as anyone if any man alive truly possessed the knowledge. Well, may that truly be said of each one of us. And as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, everyone. God, God bless, bless us, us, everyone. everyone.